introduction but John Leeson is the voice of K9 if you didn't know the be the nation's best known robot dog and he's going to speak mainly on his time on the most iconic British TV show where he um, performed in the company of David Tennant Tom Baker and Elizabeth Sladen and but first we will have an appearance by the original physical K9 attention attention I bid you a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Please delete whichever greeting is not applicable. My vocal accompanist is somewhere behind me. Not that I usually outrun anyone, even with batteries fully charged. An opportunity will be given you to probe my Mr. Speaker, as he likes to call himself, later with questions to which I already have all needful answers and can prompt him unless insufficient data obtains. As an actor, his spectrum embraces everything from Shakespeare upwards, including the never-to-be-forgotten role of a bungled bear on Rainbow, a wife-beating husband on The Bill, and as the voice of a lost piece of a jigsaw. His active professional time span of 28,908,000 minute spans of Earth time, which, as this is Cambridge, you already recognize and re-evaluate mathematically as 55 years, leap years accepted, I awaited an automated queue to offer you congratulations on your speedy conversion. But on rechecking my sensors, I detect I am in the company of enhanced brain activity in any event, a situation I record as satisfactory. Oh dear, oh dear. K9, my goodness me, there you are. I couldn't keep up with you. Bless your heart. <laughs> Um, now, I hope you haven't been patronising these, uh, these people here. No? What do you mean, no? Okay, good. Because I want you now to, re to remain on silent mode. Do you remember? I can't switch you off. Because... Do you know, this actually reminds me. Last March, I went to a Doctor Who convention over in Baltimore, which was headed up by Peter Capaldi, his doctor. And during the course of the weekend, word got back to me that Peter Capaldi was asked the question, who was your favourite character in Doctor Who? And he said, it's K-9. Fine, I thought to myself. But um, why, he was asked. Because he's got an off switch. <laughs> so I thought, well... This word got back to me as well, and I thought, I've got a bone to pick with Peter Capaldi. So what they arranged was for me to go up behind Peter Capaldi, whom I'd not yet met, when he was still sitting, signing autographs for a very long line of fans, and simply say, Interruption, Master. I have disabled my off switch. And, of course, he was delighted. He thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. So, so there we are. Um, Honour was satisfied, I think. But honour for me tonight is in being here, I must say. Uh, when I think of, of who has stood in this place and spoken, I, what's John Leeson doing here tonight? My words of thanks are very, very genuine indeed for this Totally unexpected invitation, but thank you very, very much indeed. Um, now, I don't happen to have Cantab after my name, unfortunately. Uh, my university days were spent at a place called RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. 
Do, do any of you remember a lovely old actor called Wilfred Hyde White? Yes, Wilfred Hyde White. She said, yep, drama schools, dear, don't talk to me about drama schools. I went to RADA and I learned two things. One, I couldn't act. Two, it didn't matter. <laughs> and of course, with him, it never did, because he always played Wilfred Hyde White playing something. So there we are. But uh, if any of you uh, have been infected or infused with uh, the spirit of Thespis, getting Greek here, sorry, um, and want to become actors or have some connection with the theatre in any way, I shall be around this evening, and if you want to buttonhole me, I can give any advice like, don't. No, no, I don't say don't. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I may be able to, to help in some way or other, if I possibly can. Now, me playing the voice of K-9 was... Yes, it was an accident, wasn't it? Total accident. I have to take myself right back to the year of our Lord, 1977. And here I am standing outside my home in Ealing, West London. Hot day. I'm thirsty. And I think, now I know there's a pub down the bottom of the road. I wouldn't mind going to have a beer. I'll go down there. And I go down to this pub. And inside the pub is a theatre director I'd worked with maybe a dozen years previously up in Rep Theatre in Dundee, Derek Goodwin. And Derek said, John, mate, what are you doing here? So I said, well, I just live up the road. What are you doing here? He said, well, I'm just directing a Z Cars. We've been filming around here. That dates it a bit, doesn't it, Z Cars? Um, but um, I'm going on to, to direct a, a Doctor Who. Uh, are you working at the moment? So I said, well, um, um, uh, not, not, not exactly, no. Well, tell you what, I've got an idea. Well, what's that then? No, 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 I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to. I guess you're all ahead of me by now. Um, I'm not going to tell you, but you stay by your phone and your agent may possibly ring and uh, give you some information. So I stayed by my phone, and the next week, my agent was a lovely old guy called Max Kester, uh, phoned up and said, John, I've, I've just had a call from the BBC. As though he'd never had a call from the BBC in his life before. He said, they want to know if you'd like to play not just one, but two parts in Doctor Who. What do you think? I thought, wow! This meeting with Derek, fantastic. He said, no, 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 steady, steady. What's the matter? Well, you see, that they're, they're only voice parts, you see. And I know you want to get your face around the business a little bit more, so would I. But what are the parts, I asked. So he said, well, well that's the thing. One of them is the voice of a virus, which I thought must have been the tiniest part offer I'd ever had in my entire life. And the other one is the voice of a robot dog. <laughs> what do you think? So, well, I don't know, Max, I don't know, really. Well, I should take them, he said. I should, I should take the part. They're only in for one storyline after all, so you might as well. One storyline, 1977, and here I am speaking to you tonight. Still playing K-9 on audio <laughs> for Big Finish and things like that. It is just in absolutely incredible. So, I'm sent along to see Graham Williams, who's the producer. Graham Williams doesn't have this module there, because the module is being finished off in the BBC's workshops. He says, he won't be around until the day of recording itself. Um, but this is the, the, the blueprint of Cain. I Can you do a voice for this? And I saw he'd got a tartan collar, so I saw, they said, you, you want him Scottish? Oh, no, 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 no. No, we don't want, don't want him Scottish. Uh, put, put a voice on and we'll, we'll, see, we'll see, what, see what happens. And so, 
This was a wonderful accident. During rehearsals, there was no canine, but there was me. And there was me running around on all fours, being canine, which provided an amazing dynamic, the relationship between servant and master. And Tom thought it was, Tom Baker thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. He thought it was great, very funny. And at least the other actors could see where K9 was supposed to be going. But then, come the recording day, yes, the signals that were being fed into K9 to make him move around and all the rest, twizzle his ears or whatever. Thank you. Well on cue. Um, we're on the same frequency as the cameras. K9 comes into camera shot and the cameras just go <laughs> So I thought, well, this is, this is it. This really is it. I'm standing there in the studio behind a piece of flatty, flattage or something or other, thinking K9 won't be lasting because studio time is fearsomely expensive. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be out of here before, it will be a, a one-story wonder. So there we are. Um, the Doctor Who magazine then got in touch with me because I was sort of new on the scene. And um, they, I, I was a little bit surprised because, you see, K9, having been... Uh, characterized as, as, as you see him and as you hear him, isn't the nicest personality at all. He's a smart ass. He knows it all. And he's prone to correct people where he thinks correction's needed and so forth. So he really is uh, rather full of himself. But he but can't be helped, can't be helped. I wonder if I'm like that. I must, must have given some of my own characteristics to K9, <laughs> I had to think. Anyway, those two happy accidents were brilliant. The happy accident of having met Derek in the first place in the pub, and the happy accident of having been K9 in rehearsal. Tom Baker thought the BBC had missed a trick. They thought, he thought, I should have been K9, with a nose and ears and everything else. Apparently, when uh, Tom Baker auditioned for the National Theatre, he appeared in a dog costume. Yes, well, we won't go into that too much. Now, of course, K9 became quite popular quite quickly and was invited to go on to Blue Peter. And on Blue Peter, there was a very formidable lady called Barbara Woodhouse. And Barbara Woodhouse was a dog trainer. And she was there to train, or give obedience training, to John Noakes's sheepdog, Shep, and to Goldie, who was a golden retriever, uh, under her tuition. And K-9 was going to lumber his way in at some particular point. Well, it was a good plan, but of course, Barbara Woodhouse had never heard or seen, Doc, uh, seen K9 before. She was totally flummoxed, went straight off beam, but the two dogs got terribly excited. Indeed, Shep, the sheepdog, saw an opportunity. And um, yes, well, the, uh, it was quite educational, I think, for a short while. Um, uh, the cameras had to turn away rather swiftly. <laughs> K9 was getting attentions that the BBC wouldn't have approved of, especially on Blue Peter. So there we are. But are there any historians here? Two historians, that's worth something. Do you realise that the relationship between K9 and the Doctor replicates the 17th century Commedia dell'arte relationship between the servant, who is the protagonist, and the, and the pompous master, who's likely to walk into danger. I mean, he keeps the master out of danger. Uh, and that trope works right the way through to things like Jeeves and Worcester, for example, uh, where Jeeves knows 
how to handle the master very much better. Um, and equally, buddy movies, I dare say, as well. So there we are. But one of the things that I've found in playing K-9 and being taken to places miles and miles away, places, there's a place called Australia somewhere. I think it took me a long time to get there. Uh, it's a long swim. But um, <laughs> New Zealand I've been to as well. And America quite often. I've been, as I said, this last year in Baltimore, but the original uh, visit to America for a Doctor Who convention was in Philadelphia, where, uh, would you believe that I, um, I actually failed to win a canine sound-alike contest? <laughs> it's true, it's true. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why, because I arrive at this convention, nobody knows who John Leeson is, they haven't seen John Leeson before, you know. So I go to the, sh the, the showrunner and I say, look, um, tell you what, I'm here this morning, I'm supposed to be arriving in the big main hall at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, would you, would you, would you, uh, tell you what, I'll be a fan. I'll mosey round during the morning and the early afternoon, and you can give me a cap and a badges and a long scarf and things like that, and I'll just fade into the background, won't I? Then you can tell at four o'clock, tell the audience, John Leeson has been delayed at the airport, I'm afraid, so while we're waiting for John to come, we'll have a canine sound-alike contest. How about that, eh? Okay. So, so who'd like to do it? And so various people come up and they do canine voices and things like that. And I'm called up about fourth or fifth. Uh, okay, who are you? My name's George. Okay, George, <laughs> where are you from, George? I'm from Pittsburgh. Got a big laugh. I don't know why, but it did. <laughs> but I'm from Pittsburgh. What are you going to do for us, George? So I did some canine voices. And, okay, back to your seat, George. Said, Thank you very much. Next, come along, do some more voices. Um, and then the showrunner said, uh, Look, I, I'm, yeah, I'm just, just getting a message. I hear that John Leeson has arrived at the hotel. He's actually in the building. So all the contestants back on stage, quick, 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 quick. Stand in line, stand in line, and we'll, we'll see who was best. And hands overhead, who gets the most applause? And the little guy, two down from me, got the most applause. But even then, the showrunner was perfect. He said, right, back to your seats, everybody, back to your seats. Okay, right, now, everybody. And from the back door of, the, of this big hall, much like this sort of hall, um, Will you now please welcome John Leeson? And everybody turns to the back of the hall to see me come in and I just get up from my seat. I have never in my life received such a huge ovation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute. They'd been had completely. Bless their hearts, bless their hearts. But the, the identifications that some Americans have. Oh, no, I've got a lovely Canadian friend. She's, she's very sweet. She's very crafty. She's a very good cookie. Uh, she says, the Americans, she loves them, but they have only one fault. I apologize to Americans here, if there are any, because she says their one fault is that they over-exist. Yeah, well, you can unpack that in your own, in your own time, if, if, you, if you wish. But anyhow, I discovered that the fans were really in three different tranches. The top tranche were those who don't know you at all as an actor, but assume back home you're somebody extremely famous and not likely to hobnob with anybody else. So it's a question of, uh, Mr. Leeson, do you think, uh, uh, would you mind uh, um, if, if we asked your people 
uh, to, to, to arrange maybe two or three minutes with you, you know, because we, we love what you do. And, and, but would there be a cast involved here, you know? So that's one tranche. The other tranche, which didn't involve me because, just as a voice of a character, but I could see it happening with other actors. The, the fans assumed that the actor was the character that they played. Hyper-identification, as close as that identification with the character. And that must have been quite difficult, I think, for some of the actors to, to deal with, you know. What's it like on Gallifrey? Is it cold in the winter? You know, that sort of thing. Uh, but mercifully, the, the wider tranche at the bottom uh, were, were actors, uh, were fans rather, who just could chat to you like regular guys and gals, which is, which is perfect. But there was one girl I do remember, in, I think it was in Chicago. Yes, it was, it was in Chicago. She presented herself to, to be autographed. Various parts of her body were autographed. I think I got a midriff to autograph, which was quite nice. Um, relatively flat, but some, some rounder bits were autographed by more famous actors, I'm sure. Um, but she then had all those autographs tattooed on. And I'm sure my signature, my autographed signature, is walking around Illinois somewhere, even today, which is very, very strange. Um, I think finally, because I'm, I'm chatting on far too much, I know, uh, but I had a, an envelope sent to me in the post by a fan wanting an autograph. I mean, lot, I get lots of letters with fans asking for autographs. But this one, I should have brought it with me. I have it as a prop at home. Um, simply had John Leeson on it. It was a stamped, franked envelope. John Leeson. No address whatsoever. <laughs> None. So I thought to myself, well, after all this time, having played K-9, at least the name John Leeson is now so well known. I think, do you know, I think I might have arrived. <laughs> there we are. Anyway, would you like to speak to me at all? And yes, ask that me would questions? be fantastic. Very Thank you good. so much for that. Let's have a round of applause oh, for John. Oh, no, you're welcome. <laughs> Right, now, right. you're in so, charge, you're in charge. I like to think so, sometimes. <laughs> so, firstly, starting off, when you first started to you know, develop K9, did you ever try out different voices, or did it just come, come to you naturally? I think I did try some different voices, because Graham Williams asked me, uh, or rather, I offered Graham Williams to put different voices on tape, mm -hmm. uh, the big quarter-inch tapes that we had in those, those old days, reel-to-reel uh, -reel stuff. And I think some went in, and I think the one he opted for was the one that you now hear. Uh, that one. Do you happen to remember any of the others? At all? Negative, mistress. Oh, fair play, fair play. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you were talking about how, you know, obviously K9 comes in in the 1970s. How much do you think he is a product, like as a character of the 1970s, as a society at that time? Well, I don't know, um, because he's always divided opinion. Mm -hmm. um, Graham Williams thought he was a very good... He, he, what he wanted to do was to, to try and get a, a younger group of audience coming in to watch Doctor Who. And so if you've got a, a, a speaking toy that can actually do things, um, that would be a, a, a bit of a pull. Mm -hmm. Um, but subsequently, producers like John Nathan Turner, for, exa for example, uh, weren't so keen on having K9. And in fact, I, uh, Roger uh, David Brierley, who took over from me, found that he couldn't develop the character any more than it was. Uh, it's sort of a bit WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Um, and he said he was going to run K9 out over the next three storylines, and would I consider coming back? And, but I quite liked the character, even though he's a snotty old 
whatever. Um, so, so, I, so I did come back. And here today, I'm still, I'm, I've got a, a big finish to do in about a fortnight's time. Um, again, audio stuff playing K9 still. 46? No, is it? Yes, it's 40. No, 42 years. How many? 1977, where are we? I've, I've lost. Audience Four. participation here, please. Yes, anyway. <laughs> Cambridge is a place where maths is done, I understand. Yes, yes. We like to think so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, a while ago. Fair, fair. Um, so do you think, I mean, obviously it worked to get younger viewers interested and Doctor Who has continued for, to be loved by generations of people. What do you think gives it this timeless appeal, almost, in a kind of James Bond way it's become a cornerstone of British television? It has. It has. It's the longest running sci-fi Mm -hmm. series the BBC has. Um, I don't know, because it isn't science fiction as much as science fantasy. What would you say the difference is? Um, well, I, I was involved in doing Blake Seven as mm -hmm. well. I played a couple of characters in Blake Seven, where there was more of a sort of heroic storyline. And there was more of sort of ensemble performances. You don't have the lead doctor and the, the, the notional companion, this, that, and the other. Um, but I don't know, it, it, it's interesting. I'm not sure I have the answer to that one, I'm afraid. Insufficient data. <laughs> yes, all right, okay, shush. <laughs> all right, steady. <laughs> so would you say that Doctor Who pioneered this kind of science fantasy, or do you think it was playing off something well, else? Well, it became part of the furniture, didn't it? You know, so I suppose it did pioneer it. Um, but different producers have had different takes on how Doctor Who should go. <laughs> um, indeed, the, the most recent one has looked back at history uh, to a certain extent and recreated historical subjects mm. uh, in a sort of sci-fi background, a sci-fi basis. Um, but that's very different, I think, from, from my day, where we, we were really sort of off-the-wall stuff we were doing. Tom Baker, of course, his, his brain turned on a sixpence anyway, you know, he really had the most <laughs> athletic <laughs> goings-on up there, impossible to imagine. Um, so but the, there are different producers have different takes and mm -hmm. different pushes different drives. and pulls. Yeah, Loaded ideas. question. What's your favourite push and pull? What's your favourite take on K9 that you've done? Oh, the answer is yes. You know what? It always it's short is. and snappy. I like yep. it. <laughs> always, always yes. Yes. So you've obviously you've done the main Doctor Who and you've worked on spin-off series like the Sarah Jane Adventures. Yep. What's it like working on obviously a massive show and, and then a spin-off series? Is there anything different? No. You find the process? You're working as an actor. You are Fair play. You're, you're in, within relationships and you relate and mm -hmm. you you know your own mind, canine, better than I know mine. You know, mm -hmm. so you just get that precisely. Mm -hmm. There you are. So uh, you just play the same part and. Tom Baker had a lovely word for acting. He mm -hmm. called it celebrating. You celebrate. You fill your socks. You fill your boots. You are there to be counted. And, you know, you have a sort of, sort of heroic notion almost. Um, so K-9 is, is his own hero. <laughs> so K-9, well, yes. He, he, in fact, Tom's attitude to K-9 first, I think, was potentially, this character is going to upstage me. <laughs> yeah, possibly, possibly. Um, so he didn't like K-9 that too much, but he and I, on a personal basis, got along like wildfire. We used to do the Times crossword together in <laughs> rehearsals. Yes, we did. Um, if, if there were longers in rehearsal, Tom would say, come, come on, come on over here to the side, and we'll, we'll get this crossword dealt with. It was a lovely story too about uh, the Times crossword in uh, was a story called The Stones of Blood. Look at the story of Stones of Blood. Um, an old stone circle in, in Oxfordshire I think it was. 
And I was sent down uh, to, as it were, put on the voice of K9, and my voice went down <laughs> miles. I was, I was sitting, let me get this straight. I was <laughs> sitting in a BBC technical van in the mm -hmm. driver's seat with a pair of headphones and a, and a sports lip mic, and my voice was being broadcast right down, I couldn't see, miles away, half a mile away to the location. And I heard the director's voice, it was um, Daryl Blake who was directing it, said, right, everybody, we're clear on that scene, everyone. Um, just take five and we'll set up for the next one. Then Tom's voice cuts in. John, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm there. There's my voice down there. Uh, have you got your Times crossword with you? <laughs> so, yes. So, and we did some Times crossword together. Now, what I didn't know, and what, of course, I couldn't possibly have seen, was what all the locals who had come to watch the filming could see and hear. Tom Baker sitting on the grass verge in full sunshine with canine plonk beside him, and both of them doing the Times crossword. <laughs> <laughs> Suspension of disbelief must have been complete. <laughs> wow. Yep. So would you say Doctor Who's one of the most fun series you've had to work on? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Oh, yes, Fantastic. yes, yes, yes. Yes. In terms of, and I, I know K-9 isn't the only role you've played, and I, I promise I won't stray too far from Doctor Who, but what do you think are the pros and cons of voice acting compared to, like, acting on stage or acting, physical well, acting there, on TV? There's one thing I can say, uh, uh, apropos of voicing K-9 in audio, mm -hmm. he moves so much more quickly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. He, the speed he can travel is amazing, <laughs> silently even. <laughs> but yeah, um, voice acting is quite interesting because you have to encapsulate everything, obviously, mm -hmm. in the voice. Uh, and concentrating on, on playing character, you have to, have to be very, very uh, uh, close to mm -hmm. the character that you, you've rehearsed. Um, and, of course, the pictures are so much better in audio because they're all yours. They're in your head. You can visualize. You can imagine. It's an imaginative thing. Um, yes. I've stopped. No, no, so we'll start <laughs> again. <laughs> no, no, we, we can definitely start again. Yeah. Um, so what do you think has been the most ridiculous experience you've had on set with like a doctor like Tom Baker, the most kind of fun you've had when something has gone wrong and you've just had to? Well, I've, I've touched on some of them Do already, the I think. Um, yes, I can't think now. They've, they've all been fairly ridiculous <laughs> um, because the, the, the relationship itself is fairly ridiculous. A, a grown man with a tin dog as an associate. Um, Hmm, you've got me. I'm being totally deficient. That's all right. Yes. I have three snap questions sent in by the Doctor Who Society oh. who have far more Doctor Who knowledge than I do. Oh, so, dear. This so is trouble. We'll start, we'll start <laughs> easy. So, which canine would win in a fight was the first question I was sent. I was unaware there were multiple canines. <laughs> oh, the original one would, okay. would win. Oh, yes, doubtless, doubtless. The others were just modifications. Oh, yes, no, the, yeah. yes. You'd, you're, you're very good. No, no, you're fine. Yes, you'd win, you'd win. What do you think it would be like if K-9 said yes instead of affirmative? Can we, can we have oh, a trial? No, that's interesting because there are some scripts I've been sent that the writers don't quite know how to write for K-9, mm -hmm. and so I have had to tweak them into, into k 9 speak. <laughs> if you like, so uh, affirmative is, is, is a necessary word. Um, in fact, there was one in f this last um, uh, big finish I did where there was a, a sort of little comedy routine of everybody saying no, one after each other, and they tried it out with K-9 saying no, and it just fell flat on its <sighs> face. So, um, no, no, no. Negative. And that would work, you see, that worked quite well. You, you, heard, you heard a titter. <laughs> you did, yes, I heard a titter. 
presenting his, his best voice. And the last, last question, does K9 have USB charge ports? I feel like the answer will be no, but I will ask it for the Doctor Who Society. Not that I, I am know. aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm aware. No. He may have been mistreated by Shep in the past, but mm -hmm. the ports that he has, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see any. <laughs> no, I don't. Th no, I oh. think that's a, a, a sign of, of uh, ascent or something. He doesn't have those ports. Such a shame. Oh. <laughs> So you, you say that K9 has a very strong like character voice. Mm. Do you think he had much character growth throughout the, the series? Throughout Not very the... much. Mm -hmm. um, he, he is he's pretty well pretty well what you see, um, and it's up to the writers in a large extent to mm -hmm. either have him taken over by something where it, all his usual functions are subverted, or whatever else. But in essence. K9 is, is what you see, I think. So it, uh, that doesn't stretch me too much as an actor, <laughs> does it, really? <laughs> not like Shakespeare, I can imagine. No, no, <laughs> oh, absolutely not. No, no, no. Yes. No. But it's been enormous mm. fun over all these years uh, to, have, to have played mm. this character. And, but the trouble is, of course, you're, you're now known for it and nobody casts you for anything else. Um, any casting directors out there? Yes, no, I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> so, what, what has it been like actually starting from, you know, rel relatively unknown, going to this massive, massive cultural movement? What's it been like, that development for you as, you as an actor? For and me your, as an actor, uh, constant surprise, mm -hmm. really. Um, I'm just overwhelmed by the worldwide uh, fandom there is mm -hmm. for, for Doctor Who. I mean, there are really lively groups equally in Germany. I've been over to fan conventions in Germany uh, where they just love Doctor Who to bits, mm -hmm. and equally in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, it, it is it just surprise, constant surprise. I'm one of those people to whom things happen <laughs> from totally unexpected directions, like being here this evening, <laughs> for example. You know, who would have thought it? You've had Theodore Roosevelt here. You've had Churchill. You've had Margaret, what, what was her name? Th th oh, Thatcher, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> had a mental blank for a moment. Yes, there we are. So... So. Any any questions yes. from? We have a third person up the floor. Yes, um, second row along. Yes, you. <laughs> uh, what would K9 think of Jodie Whittaker? Oh, I, he he would love Jodie Whittaker. Yes. Oh no no. It's uh, he he'd have a thought first of all. What do I call this particular master? <laughs> Mistress master, <laughs> or <laughs> masteress. <laughs> what I don't, <laughs> whatever I don't know, something like that. But no, um, one of the characteristics of dogs in any event is loyalty, isn't it? Um, so he, he's a very loyal creature, despite his 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 other um, unfortunate tendencies to be patronising and knowing it all. Yes. You're very versatile, aren't you, K9? <laughs> your head goes there, and your head goes there, and that's about it. And oh! oh! <laughs> surprise, surprise, how wonderful. Thank you very much. Do we have a question on the, on the front There was row? a question at the front here. Yes. Bring, bring back the K9 company. Yep. Um, do, you, do, you, do you regret the fact that it didn't, it didn't a spin-off that never happened? Yes, I do, really. Um, I think that would have been quite fun. But I think that was aimed at a rather younger age group than the, the generality of, of, of viewers. Um, there are plans, I know, to make a movie called Canine Timequake. And I believe there is money now behind it, uh, which will be preceded by two television series, but again, with an all-singing, all-dancing um, 
canine, not this mm. particular one, but I dare say I might be asked to voice it. It's entirely possible. So we shall see. Yes, <laughs> yes, quite. No, I'm with you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was mooted first two years ago, and it was announced as a definite last autumn, and I'm still waiting, so... <laughs> I'm always the last to hear about anything, believe you me. <laughs> the actor is the last person to be consulted. Any other questions? At well, the back there? I missed that, I'm afraid. Would you, would you turn on your microphone? <laughs> yep. Technical difficulty. Have, Negative. Have you ever Works, heard huh? Canine's voice? There we go. Oh, there we go. Yep. Um, have you ever listened to Canine's voice in a different language? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. <laughs> it would be... It would be... Yep. Oh, Freunde, nicht diese Töne, sondern lasst uns angenehmere Entstimmen und freudenvollere. That is by silly, silly, negative, silly, silly, negative, Schiller. That is correct or words to that effect. <laughs> yes. Did we have one over there? Yes. Oh, the Australian one. Uh, it's a now rather a dim memory, to tell you the truth. It was quite some while ago. Uh, and there again, it was a different canine. They wanted a... They wanted a different voice, and they wanted all sorts of di different inputs. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't classic. I do remember that. Um, so I had a little bit of a stretch, I think, with that one, with the Australian one. It would have been nice to do, I suppose, for, for, for continuation and a fee. I always do, do things for a fee. <laughs> it's always a good thing to do. Any more? Any more? Throw out your most niche trivia. I do, I do have some other questions left. Good. Which is also niche trivia. So, <laughs> it might be niche trivia. I don't, I don't know that much about canine. So, one question I got sent in was, did canine need Leela to move his chess pieces, or was he just trying to include her? I think he was trying to include her. Oh, he's very inclusive. Yes. Oh, yes, Despite yes, yes. being a massive smart-ass. Yes. <laughs> yes. Bishop, tonight, six, mistress. Incorrect. <laughs> Bishop tonight, six. <laughs> do you think Canine would be as popular if he first put on today's show? Like, do you think the mood of Doctor Who has changed? I think it has. Yes, I think it has. But, uh, but I think, uh, well, f fashions change mm -hmm. so much uh, as well. Um, because, the well, I, I speak, spoke to... Uh, uh, lovely guy whose whose wife was involved quite heavily with in the doctor who thing and he's saying they shouldn't be calling it doctor who anymore because it's it's not classic it's 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 lost its original um heft if you'll excuse another foreign mm. word and what um, sense would you what sense would you say that is? um what's changed it's become more serious it's mm -hmm. become more it's become darker in some ways there was, in terms of the fourth doctor in Tom Baker, mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a lightness and lift. Uh, it's not that it wasn't taken seriously, but there was, there was a joy behind it. It, it, had, it, 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 it was on its own trampoline. It, it bounced. Uh, today, it's taken, more, I think, more seriously, which I think is a shame. Um, but that's just personally, that's me talking mm -hmm. as, as, as a viewer. Um, I don't say that with any great passion or anything, <laughs> no. So what do you think, if we're talking about the new series, I mean, obviously we now have the first female Doctor, which is fantastic. Um, do you, what direction do you think the new, and, and we're going to have a, a new producer, are they going to take the show in? 
We've, you've talked about the kind of historical, you know, give us some... Haven't a clue. clue. I enough. haven't a clue. Do you think the canine would... Mind reading, well? not possible. <laughs> this unit, mistress. <laughs> um, yes, I don't think... I don't think uh, I would know where to take it, quite honestly, now. Um, you may have, all of you, individual ideas of your own, mm. wor what you want to see. And I mm. dare say, as Doctor Who Association, Doctor Who Society or whatever, you make your own representations as to, as to what you want to the BBC. <laughs> and, um, and say that you're barking up the wrong... No, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> you're... you're uh, you're off target. Bring it back on target, please. Something like that. So, last question. Which doctor do you think the canine worked best with as a character, do you think? Which did he play off the best? He played off very well with Tom, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an initial relationship there. Also, David Tennant. And was that because you got on well with them personally? Or was yes, it, the... it was, I think. Yes, it was. Uh, we, we got to know how we ticked. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I suppose some of that fed into the way I played K-9 uh, originally and uh, re remained. Yes, you're quite, quite right. Yes, you get those ears going. <laughs> That's quite right. But it's been... A huge privilege to have played K9 across all these years. It really has. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a lucky bunny. I really am because I know a lot of actors of my age of, you know, parts of sort of dried up. They've sort of finished at 50 or whatever, mm. and I'm nearly 107. <laughs> <laughs> so. oh. Well, thank you so much. Can we get another round of applause for John? Oh, bless you. Ready? Let's go. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you. Bless you. You're very good. Oh, dear, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> I take my voice out on a plate.